Why is Amazon worth $1.8 trillion today? If we had to boil down the company's success to one word, it would be this, optionality. So what does optionality mean? And how can investors use optionality to invest successfully? We'll tell you everything you need to know about this incredibly important business concept next. My name is Brian Feroldi. And my name is Brian Stoffel. Thanks to Quarter for sponsoring today's video. Brian, optionality can be a difficult word to wrap your head around. When somebody says, what is optionality? How would you respond? Well, I would respond by giving them a very simple definition. Optionality is when you decide to try something out. Like, let's say, painting your room yellow. And if it doesn't work out, like it didn't here, it's not the end of the world because you can always change it. But if it does work out, the results can be enormously beneficial. If we take that concept and apply it to business terms, I personally think of optionality as a company's ability to launch new products or new services that open up new revenue opportunities for the business. And if a company can do that successfully, it can drive immense shareholder returns. Now, Brian, it's important to provide some context about where optionality fits into a business's strategy. When I think about where optionality fits in, I'm reminded of something that Nassim Taleb calls the barbell technique. That is where a company will devote 80 to 90% of its resources more conservatively. What that means is that it's investing in a business that has a predictable upside and limited downside. That's usually means it's also protected by a wide moat. But on the other end of the barbell, the company is willing to take more risks with just 10 to 15 percent of its resources. These risks are worth it because the upside is unlimited. And because such a small percentage of resources are being devoted to it, the downside is largely capped and contain. This barbell technique applies to more than just investment decisions that companies are making. You can also apply the same concept to thinking about your job or your career. On the one hand, you can devote a significant amount of your time to a salaried, normal nine to five job that's safe, secure, and provides a predictable income. But you can also use a small amount of the time on nights and weekends to become a stand-up comedian or to start a small business. Those things don't necessarily have an immediate pay off, but they hold huge long-term potential if they work out. You could also take this same framework and apply it to your investments. In fact, this is officially how Nassim Taleb talks about creating an anti-fragile portfolio where you devote 80 to 90% of your resources to incredibly safe investments like cash or bonds. But you take that other 10 to 15% and you invest in things that are far more volatile, things like options or cryptocurrencies or biotech stocks where the chance for success might be small, but if you hit, it has unlimited upside potential. I think of that optionality almost as if playing the lottery. You're taking a small amount of money and you have the chance to get a huge payoff if it works out. Now let's cherry pick an example to show how this might work out. Say in 2015, you had a million dollars in your nest egg. You decided to put 900,000 of that in cash and bonds, which is really smart if you want to preserve what you have. But you take that leftover 100,000 and you invest in, say, Bitcoin. Well, through the first three years that you make this investment, you're able to maintain your cash balance. Of course, inflation will in eat into it a little bit, but the fact of the matter is you know you can't lose that. The Bitcoin, on the other hand, starts appreciating a little bit, which is kind of nice. But then 2018 hits, and that small investment you made in Bitcoin is now worth $5 million. Now, of course, because that side of the barbell has volatile investments, the next couple of years might show losses, but then 2021 hits post pandemic and it goes up to $10 million. The important thing to note about this is that all the while you only risk losing 10% of what you put into it. When you reach $5 million in 2018 or $10 million in 2021, you can change it so that you're still holding 90% of what you have in cash and just devoting a little bit to that other end of the barbell. In this case, it was Bitcoin. As you said at the beginning, this is obviously an extremely cherry-picked example where the thing that you put your money into really worked out. That's not important. What's important is the concept that we're trying to hammer home. So let's use this same framework, but now apply it to companies that we can invest in. We started out by talking about Amazon, so let's go back to Amazon. When the company launched in the 90s, this is what their web page looked like. Never would anyone have guessed that Amazon is the company that provides cloud services to a huge portion of the world, but also delivers maybe up to 50% of what your family buys in a given year. 
How did we get there? Let's examine it. Rewind the clock to the late 1990s when Amazon was first getting started and what did it sell? Books. That was its core business that was growing rapidly and clearly had big potential. And Amazon was devoting most of its resources to feeding that business. But at the same time, it was taking a small amount of its capital and was putting in high risk projects such as auctions and third party merchants. Well, guess what? That auctions business, that did not work out, but that third party merchants business sure did. So then we can fast forward a number of years and now we see that yes, books are still on that left side of the barbell, but because third party merchants was so successful, it shifts over and it's on that side as well. But the company decided to keep taking those risky bets and it decided to invest in a fashion retail concept or Amazon web services or Amazon prime or fulfillment by Amazon. Well, we know that that fashion retail concept didn't work out, but those other three were enormously successful. Over time, those experiments were clearly paying off and Amazon continued to plow resources into them, but it also kept on innovating because this optionality concept was working so well. So we saw new innovations come along, such as Quidsy and original video content that we now know as Prime Video. Or how about the Fire Phone? Or how about Amazon Wallet? Does the Fire Phone or Amazon Wallet not ring a bell? That's because those projects didn't work out. But I'm quite confident that you have heard of Amazon Prime Video. So what happens when we invest in a company that shows this level of optionality? Well, a simple $10,000 investment in Amazon back when it went public in the 90s is worth almost $20 million today. Amazon is obviously an extreme outlier, but it shows how the company's commitment to continually innovating and investing in optionality has really paid off for its long-term shareholders. It's important to note that this can happen with much smaller companies as well. One such company is Axon Enterprises. It used to be known as Taser International. And for the first 20 years of its life as a company, it simply produced stun guns for police forces. Starting in 2010, the company started to invest in other side projects, such as body cameras, a software platform called evidence.com, and another product called Axon Fleet. Each of these products were experiments when the company first started them, but over time it became clear that they were seeing gradual market adoption and they became key parts of the company's core business. Fast forward to today, and the company is not taking the pedal off of its optionality. It is creating services like Axon Records, which can autofill paperwork for police officers to spend more time in the community, or Axon Dispatch, which allows a dispatcher to see where an entire force is in real time. The fact of the matter is these are small experiments that when they hit, make an enormous difference. Just like we saw with Amazon, if you invested $10,000 in Axon when it first came public, that $10,000 has grown into more than $3 million today. Key reason is the company's commitment to optionality. Now, Axon and Amazon are obviously two cherry-picked examples, but when I think about some of the biggest winners of all time that I've ever owned, all of them have this optionality concept built right into the core business model. So if optionality is so important to identifying, the question then becomes, well, how do you identify it before it becomes blatantly obvious to everyone else in the market? Before we get into that, we wanted to give a shout out to this video's sponsor, Quarter. With Quarter, you get frictionless access to conference calls, investor presentations, transcripts, and earnings reports from markets around the world straight to your pocket for no cost. Quarter's mission is to change the way that people look at investor relations and create a completely new bridge between companies and their stakeholders. The first step on this journey is to let you, the user, interact with the company's content while you're listening. If you're interested in giving Quarter a try for free, visit the app store of your choice and search for Quarter. That's Q-U-A-R-T-R. -R. Thanks, Quarter, for sponsoring the video. All right, Brian, so how can investors identify optionality before it happens? Well, one key way that we think investors can do just that is by looking at a company's mission statement. You and I very focused on a company's mission statement more so than I would say 95% of other investors. One reason why is because we view a mission statement almost as like a company's North Star, or it's like a compass that employees can use to make decisions about what they should do next. And Brian, if we look at some of the companies we talked about today, we see that play out. Since day one, Amazon's mission statement has been to be Earth's most customer-centric company. And if you think about their evolution, 
evolution through time. They saw industries where the incumbents were not customer centric and they introduced solutions that were more customer centric. Note that Amazon's mission wasn't to become Earth's biggest bookstore. It was to become Earth's most customer centric company. The company wasn't tied down to one specific strategy. It left the doors open for the company to explore any avenue that it wanted to. We see the same thing when we talk about our second company, Axon Enterprises. The company's mission was to protect life. Tasers obviously did that by offering a solution to the bullet. However, body cameras and software solutions accomplish that very same goal. A great more recent example of this is Tesla. Tesla's mission since day one has been to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. It wasn't to build the world's best sport cars. The company is on a mission to transition the world away from fossil fuels and doing so gives this company unlimited room to explore new products and services. After the mission statement, we think another way that investors can figure out if a company has optionality or not is by looking at the company's own history and asking themselves, had this company demonstrated a track record of launching new products and services? If you go back to a company like Wix, for example, which allows people to create their own websites and e-commerce presence, you see that from 2015 to this year, the company has rolled out innumerable products that its users can use to do a better job of selling themselves online. Another great example of this concept that we see today is HubSpot. HubSpot started out as just a tool for marketing professionals, but over time it has since evolved to adding tools for salespeople, service people, a content management system, and more. The company has demonstrated a clear history of rolling out new products and services that opened up new market opportunities for the company. No surprise, both of these company stocks have spanked the market since they came public. Brian, we know that looking for companies that have optionality is a lot different and probably more difficult than simply looking at companies' financial statements, but we think it's worth the effort over the long run. For sure. I love stumbling upon a new company that I've never heard of before that clearly shows signs of optionality, especially if that company is small and growing quickly. That begs the question, what companies do you think have clear signs of optionality today? We would love to research them ourselves. Let us know in the comments section below what companies you think have optionality built into their DNA. We hope this video is helpful and helps you to invest better. Brian's out.